Today is all about wedding venues. I'm sharing a ton of your venue questions and I have a detailed checklist for you if you're still in the early phases of shopping around for the perfect place to host your big day. That's all coming up next on the Wedding Planning Podcast. Hey there, it's Kara, and I believe that every engaged couple deserves the expertise of a down-to-earth, honest, and professional wedding planner. Today, we're going to talk all about shopping for your wedding venue, and I even put together a totally free checklist for you to print out, save, do whatever you'd like with it. I hope it is really, really helpful. You can find that checklist by visiting weddingplanningpodcast.co slash wv. For wedding venue. That website again is weddingplanningpodcast.co slash WV. Enjoy the show. Why, hello there and welcome to today's show. Thank you so much as always for being here with me. Today we're focusing on your wedding venue in a show that is packed with your wonderful questions. And later on in the show, I'm also going to share a detailed checklist that you'll want to keep close as you start doing your research into finding the perfect place to host your big day. I took an informal poll a couple of weeks ago on Instagram, and we're split about 50-50 between listeners who have and have not chosen their venue yet. Even if you've already selected your perfect venue and signed the contract, if it's in the books, stay tuned because there's still plenty of good information in today's show for you to enjoy. Let's get started with your wonderful questions on all things wedding venue. Everything from tips for booking a private property, how much of the budget should go towards the venue, prepping for weather, venue lighting, the distance between the ceremony and reception spots, and so much more. A really common request that I get or request slash question on venues is asking for details on how to book a private property where you can host the wedding. This is a great option for smaller sized weddings. It's also a good option if you're looking for more of a weekend long experience. So like a wedding weekend that's going to span over a Friday, a Saturday and a Sunday. It's great to have the luxury of being able to have your closest family stay on site right in that property with you. And of course, there's the flexibility of having a blank space where you can source your own vendors and do every single thing exactly your way. Let's do a walkthrough on how I would suggest you start your search for private properties where you can host the wedding. Okay, I'm going to randomly select three cities across the entire country and let's do a little online search for Airbnbs that would let you host the wedding on the property. So the first city I'm going to choose is Seattle, Washington. Let's go to the middle of the country and do Dallas, Texas. And then let's head to the East Coast and do Boston, Mass. So on airbnb.com, that's where I would suggest you start. And up in the search bar, let's start with Seattle, Washington. And let me walk you through a couple of things to look out for when you start the search. So first of all, you're of course gonna need to select the dates. I'm gonna just choose a date, a weekend day in April of 2020. Okay, and then once you get your results back, it's going to ask you about the number of guests. Now, obviously, we're booking this to host the wedding at, but that doesn't necessarily mean that 80 wedding guests are going to stay there. So let me choose 12 adults just so that we get a big property and we'll go from there. So the most important filter that you're going to need to hit first before you go any further and you're gonna find that under filters along the top. And under house rules, you're gonna wanna mark suitable for events and then hit show. And then this gives you the properties 
that are open and willing to let you host events. Now, and before you go any further with this, you are absolutely 100% going to have to reach out to the property owner and explain to them exactly what you're doing. This is not the time to be tricky. This is not the time to make things up. This is not the time to try to hide the fact that you indeed have the intention to host your wedding at this house. You need to reach out to the host, be very transparent, very clear, very, very, very forthcoming about exactly how many guests you're planning on having and whether or not this is something that they are open to. I'm going on the record and telling you, you must be 100% honest and transparent about your intention to host a wedding event here. And then you can go from there. I don't know what the host response is going to be. You'll likely have to send a bunch of messages. John and I booked a private place for our own wedding and he sent dozens, if not up to the hundred of messages to properties looking for the perfect place that would let us do our vision. So this is going to take patience. This is going to take a lot of research. I think it will be totally worth it. I'm not going to do... Um Boston. To recap, here are some really important takeaways. Number one, search Airbnb and filter by properties in the area that are suitable for events. This is an absolute must. Next, you're going to reach out to property owners and explain in 110% transparent details that you are planning to host a wedding on their property and will that be okay? You need to be specific about the number of guests, the time of day, who will actually be staying on site at the property, and any other applicable details that might apply to your wedding. You're going to repeat these steps until you find the perfect property. Be patient, be tenacious, and be willing to put in the work. You might need to send dozens of messages and you will likely receive dozens of no's. Don't let it discourage you. This is one of my hands down favorite ways to host a wedding, although I will say it's not for everyone. From the very beginning, be realistic about your situation, and that includes the guest count, the amount of time you have available to do extra planning and to make all these additional arrangements. Realistically, if you have a guest count up in the 200 plus number range, <laughs> this is probably not going to be a great option for you. If we're talking a smaller sized wedding between 50 and 100 people, it can definitely work. But again, it is going to require a lot of extra planning and a lot of effort, extra time and effort on your part. If you're listening and you know of a property in your area that specializes in wedding rentals or event space rentals, please do reach out and share. I would love to pass that information along to others. And if you want to go ahead with this route, I wish you good luck in your search. And again, be in touch and let me know how it's going in your area. All right, next question is all-inclusive venues versus customizable venues where you provide the food, the rentals, etc. So this one is in lots of ways related to the first question, and I'll share some of my thoughts on all-inclusive versus blank slate venues. An all-inclusive venue is a great option for you if you're planning from out of town or out of state. It's great if you're tight on time due to commitments to work or school, and it's also a great option if you simply don't want to be involved in all the logistics. Maybe that's totally not your thing. All-inclusive venues are perfect for you if you're looking for a place where you can make a few decisions, submit your preferences to a staff, and then have everything set up and taken care of. And you just get to show up on the wedding day, sit back and relax and enjoy. 
Okay, it probably won't be that easy, but you know what I mean. Not everyone has hours of time or even the desire to become a mini wedding planner and plot out every single last meticulous detail about the wedding day. And that's totally fine. Now, for others of us, very opposite, that's the fun. You want to be involved in every single meticulous detail. You have the time. You want to be able to customize every single thing from the food to the flowers to the table shapes and sizes. In that case, a more non-traditional wedding space is perfect for you. So if you're up for the challenge of taking more of a blank space, a more non-traditional wedding space, and transforming it for your wedding day, I have just a couple of guidelines. The first one is that you must have the time to commit to doing the extra work and research on your own. Be really realistic in the very beginning of planning and understand that this is something that you really want to take on in the months to come. It's gonna consume a lot of your time, a lot of your energy, it's gonna take a lot of decision making, so just be sure that you're up for that. And the second thing to consider is be very, very mindful of your budget. Do-it-yourself spaces and do-it-yourself setups are infamous, infamous for costs piling up really, really quickly. You might get sticker shock from an all-inclusive venue and go with the cheaper option where you have to do all the work and the planning. However, you also might come to find out down the road that doing all the details on your own ends up being much more expensive in the long run than the all-inclusive price tag that scared you away in the beginning. So forecast things out and be realistic about everything that this is going to entail to make sure that you don't end up busting your budget down the road over things that you didn't think of in the beginning. I won't go into a ton of detail. This could be its own standalone show. Easily, I could talk about it for an hour. Some common expenses that can sneak up when you do this type of a setup are event rentals like tables and chairs and linens. That can get really pricey really quickly. And then keep in mind you need to bring in staff from offsite to be serving food and cleaning things up and setting everything up. Again, I won't go into too much detail in this show. Maybe down the road, we could do an entire show dedicated to things to watch out for if you're doing more of a DIY venue setup. Okay, next question. Let's talk about how much of your wedding budget should go towards the venue. This is a good question. And unfortunately, it's impossible for me to give a really blanket general answer to this. What you budget for the venue should depend on your overall budget, your location, the time of year, and most importantly, your overall wedding vision. So there's not a magical number or percentage that will be suitable for every couple. With that said, I personally think that your venue is worth a splurge. The space you choose really sets the tone of the entire wedding day, and there are plenty of auxiliary things that can be cut out if necessary to make room in your budget for the perfect wedding venue. Now, you could get lucky and score a beautiful venue like a public garden or a park for just a couple hundred dollars. Or on the flip side, you could dedicate half or more of your budget to a beautiful estate where you can set up for the entire weekend. It really just depends on your priorities and your preferences and where you are willing to splurge and save. I would caution you against committing more than, say, 50% of your budget to a venue without looking down the road and considering all the other expenses that are going to come up. That's not to say 
that you shouldn't spend 50% or even more of your budget on the venue. Just don't jump into something really early on without stepping back and taking in the whole picture. And to give you an example of what I mean, if your budget is $10,000 and you find an all-inclusive venue that costs $7,000, so that's 70% of your budget, that all-inclusive venue includes food, drinks, cake, decorations, tables, chairs, parking, day of coordinator, space for the ceremony, all the setup, all the cleanup, the tips, every single thing is included, then I think that's a great option. And it's totally doable for you to budget out the remaining $3,000 in your budget to cover things like photography, your dress, and all the other little extras. So in that case, I think spending 70% of your wedding budget makes a lot of sense. It really just depends. And I don't wanna get too off track here, This question could spin in so many different ways, but to sum it up, I do think your venue is worth a splurge, but you're going to have to be the one to decide what number makes the most sense for your unique situation. Coming up after a quick break, I'm going to share more of your questions and an ultimate guide to everything you need to consider when shopping for the perfect venue. I have a confession. (laughs) I've always been a little bit intimidated by shopping for protein at the grocery store. Now, I know that sounds a little ridiculous, but choosing the highest quality meat and knowing the best cuts and instinctively feeling that I know what is or isn't a good price has always been a complete mystery to me. Well, problem solved. I can't stop raving to my friends and family about ButcherBox. Each month, ButcherBox delivers a variety of high-quality, healthy protein from humanely raised animals that are never given antibiotics or added hormones. The best part is that I don't have to guess anymore. The ButcherBox website is incredibly informative and gives me the freedom to select exactly what I want delivered each month for less than $6 per meal. Everything shows up right at my doorstep, packed on dry ice. There's no commitment and you can cancel anytime. For $20 off your first box plus two pounds of ground beef and two packs of bacon, go to butcherbox.com slash wedding or enter promo code wedding at checkout. That's butcherbox.com slash wedding or enter promo code wedding at checkout for $20 off your first box plus two pounds of ground beef and two packs of bacon. There are two big problems with suit and tuxedo rental for your wedding day. Number one is that getting motivated to spend your weekend stuck in a formal wear store crawling with annoying salespeople. Ugh, I can literally think of a million things I'd rather be doing on my weekend. The second problem is that you've got to carve out the time to actually pick the suits up the day before the wedding, not to mention pray that everything actually fits. With everything else that's going on, do you really need all that added stress and pressure just hours before the wedding? Well, breathe a sigh of relief because Generation Tux solves all of it. Here's how it works. Visit generationtux.com where you can build your look online right from the comfort of your couch. The best part is that everything arrives on the doorstep of all the party members 14 days before the wedding. Whew, that way, if there are any fit issues at all, you've got plenty of time to take care of it. You'll enjoy free round trip shipping, free swatches to see in person, free home try on, and a free rental for the groom with five paid party members. Save the time, save some money, and most importantly, save your sanity by checking these guys out at generationtux.com slash wed planning and use promo code wed planning for 10% off the entire groom's party. 
If you're dreaming of a unique and unforgettable honeymoon and wanting some free help with the planning, booking, and all the details, Susan's Travel Services is the perfect solution for you. A lot of couples I hear from are concerned that working with a travel agent is one more expense to pay, and that's simply not true. In fact, working with Susan to plan your exotic honeymoon is totally free, and it'll likely save you a ton of time and money over researching and booking everything on your own. Susan and her team specialize in travel around the world and will find you the best deals on all-inclusive resorts in Mexico and the Caribbean, exotic cruises, overwater bungalows in the Maldives, or the African safari that you've always dreamed of. Don't get overwhelmed with the millions of places and options online. Get some free help and rely on professional experience to make sure you get exactly what you're looking for in your dream honeymoon. Email Susan and tell her you heard this ad to get $50 off your honeymoon. Tell a friend and get a $50 referral fee if they mention your name at the time of their booking. Email Susan at Susan'sTravelServices.com for free honeymoon planning services and get $50 off when you book with Susan and her team. Okay, we're back with more of your wonderful venue questions. And next up, let's talk about preparing an outdoor venue when it might be cold or hot or raining or snowing on your wedding day. The most important thing with weather is to have a backup plan. An outdoor venue space should always have a plan B for inclement weather. And this is a really critical question for you to ask during the venue shopping phase. Now, if you are out in the middle of the desert and this venue doesn't have an airtight plan B for a complete rain out, that's not a deal breaker. <laughs> Let's also say if you're in Southern California and the venue doesn't have a plan for it being sub-zero degrees or snowing, of course, but there should reasonably be some form of backup plan if you're looking at a completely outdoor venue space. They need to have somewhere for you to go if it starts pouring rain out of a clear blue sky. Now, a side of rain, which is the stereotypical wedding day curse, but I hear is good luck. So depending on where you sit in that, it's also a good idea to be prepared, just generally speaking, for it to be hot or cold extremely hot, extremely cold, or anywhere in the middle. We want to keep your guests comfortable and relaxed and just enjoying the reception and not worried about shivering or sweating their brains out. So this is going to depend, of course, on your location and also the time of year. For chilly weather, cold weather, light blankets are great to have on hand. Now, don't freak out and start wondering where on earth you're going to find 100 blankets for your wedding guests. I hopped on Etsy.com and I found beautiful pashmina scarves or wraps for $5 or less each, depending on how many you buy. They can be customized with a really pretty wrapper and they come in over 30 colors. I'll be sure to leave a link to those in the show notes. This is a wonderful thing to have stacked up in a basket as your guests enter an outdoor reception space so that they can grab one, wrap it around their shoulders, put it over their laps, and stay cozy. And side note, those would double as a really fun guest favor as well. They could take them home. For heat, you can look at making fans. We had a listener a couple of weeks ago who's doing her own fans, and there are plenty of wedding fan templates that you can download for free or for very little cost. This is an easy DIY project. It's also something that you could find pretty inexpensively. Hop on Google and do a search for wedding day fans. And this is a good way for your guests not only to obviously fan themselves, <laughs> but it can also be used just as shade against sun that might be coming straight down in people's faces. 
And then on the subject of it being hot and sunny, if you are concerned about sun exposure, ask your venue if they have portable umbrellas that can be brought out or even canopies that can be set up to provide your guests with some shade. I'm in San Diego, Southern California, and especially late in the summer, early in the fall, we can have some really hot days. So having some shade available for people to take cover under is definitely a must. Next venue topic, let's talk about lighting. A handful of you are curious about how to dress up your venue's lighting situation without spending a fortune on custom lighting. So oftentimes DJs will offer in tandem in a package that they will do custom up lighting, custom dance floor lighting. Of course, this is wonderful, but of course, surprise, surprise, it costs extra. And if you're being really, really mindful about your budget, you might not have the spare few hundred dollars or more to go all out with really professionally done lighting. So let's talk about some workarounds that you can do on your own. Never underestimate the beauty of simple white Christmas lights. They go a long way in creating a really soft, really romantic glow. So consider stocking up on them and draping them throughout your reception space. You can drape them down in pretty patterns from the ceiling. These could be strung straight down in stripe lines down the walls. However your space is set up or however you can work that, that's definitely a really affordable item to stock up on. White lights are also really, really pretty when they're just loosely arranged inside tall glass jars. This makes a great centerpiece idea and it doubles as romantic lighting. And this is perfectly aligned with shows from a couple of weeks ago all about unique and affordable centerpiece ideas. I have a couple of visuals on this to share with you, and I put them up on the Wedding Planning Podcast DIY Project Guide Pinterest board. That was a mouthful. (laughs) Not to worry. I'll leave a link to that in the show notes so that you can go and take a look at just how pretty this is. And it's a totally easy really doable project that you could set up on your own. Find some wholesale pricing on lights and on glass containers and you would be all set good to go. And then one final tip on lighting. Are there any bulbs that you could simply replace with a softer light? Definitely ask your venue (laughs) before you start going around and unscrewing and replacing light bulbs. But simply swapping out for a really low wattage bulb would also go a really long way in softening the lighting in the venue. And the next question is a really good one. This is about distance and ideal location of the venue. So how far is too far for guests to have to drive between the ceremony and the reception? If you are still on the hunt for your venue, I would highly, highly recommend that you bump it up to the top of your priority list to ideally have the ceremony and the reception at the same location. I know this isn't always possible, especially for those of you doing a church ceremony, but the closer the better and the same property is a total game changer in terms of convenience and overall guest experience. Now, if traveling between two different sites is just unavoidable in your situation, then my next piece of advice is the closer, the better. The less driving time, the less time lapse between, the better. If you're in a rural setting, then let's face it, some driving time might simply be unavoidable. You can't get around it. If I had to put a cap or a limit on how far is too far, I'd say if you have the absolute perfect ceremony spot and the perfect reception venue, and you're 100% in love with both places, then I'd say one hour in the car between spots is the upper limit. 
upper limit. That's a long time for your guests to get in the car and have to drive to the next spot. Again, if your situation is just unavoidable, then that's fine. People will deal with it. People are still going to come to the wedding, not to worry. But if it can be avoided, the closer, the better. And last question for today before we shift gears into my wedding venue shopping checklist, you're concerned about the wait time between the ceremony and the reception. I'm going to go ahead and read this whole question just the way it was sent in to give all the background information. And I want to spend a couple minutes here because this is a really common dilemma. Our church is only available at 11 o'clock a.m. and I'm torn between two venues. The one I really love won't be available for us until 3 o'clock. The other venue that we're considering we could be in as early as 1 o'clock. So the church is available at 11 if the ceremony lasts 30 minutes and the drive time is 30 minutes. That puts us at noon. What would guests do for one to three hours before the reception? Hmm, this really is not ideal. To recap really quickly, church is available at 11, 30-minute ceremony, 30-minute drive time. That puts us at noon. One venue is available at 1. One venue isn't available until 3 o'clock. So one to three hours of time to fill between the ceremony and the reception. So we can all agree that this is not really an ideal situation. It's easy enough to fill an hour with light snacks and some refreshments and maybe lawn games and the driving time, etc. That's doable. But three hours, I think, is really pushing it in terms of keeping people occupied. However, I know you're in love with the three o'clock venue, so let's hash this out and talk through some options. Now, for the people who are local or staying in hotels, they could, in theory, attend the ceremony at 11 and then go home or go to their hotel and hang out for three hours until the reception starts. It's not ideal, again, but it's definitely doable. If you find yourself in a situation like this, maybe it's not a three-hour gap, that's really long, maybe it's a two-hour gap, brainstorm, are there any local attractions or shopping and dining districts that you could point people to where they could go do a lunch break, walk around, sit at a bar and have a couple drinks? Maybe you could even arrange an off-site cocktail hour where guests meet at a pub or at a bar and everyone has a drink together and everyone shares a couple of appetizers to kill an hour or two and then move on to the reception. Those are just a couple ideas. Now, I totally understand the venue love at first sight. I really do. But the three-hour wait time is really a strike against choosing that venue. I'm not saying it can't work, but from a logistical standpoint, it's just not ideal. And one last idea, throwing it out there. You mentioned the church is only available at 11 o'clock a.m. Maybe your pastor would be available to come off-site and perform the ceremony later in the day. Even though the church itself isn't available, maybe they could visit the venue later on, say like 2-ish, and then that venue is open and available to you at 3 o'clock. That might be a good option if you're open to having the ceremony in another spot other than the church. Woo, we covered a lot. I hope this has been really, really helpful in terms of some venue things to be on the lookout for. And a huge thank you so very much for taking the time to send in your questions. To wrap things up today, let's shift gears and I'm going to share an ultimate guide to everything you need to consider when shopping for the perfect venue. Enjoy. So to start the show, I'm just going to say that shopping for your wedding venue can definitely be really, really stressful. And that's because there's a ton of 
pressure. The wedding venue, in my opinion, is the biggest decision that you and your partner are going to make during your entire wedding planning journey. And again, that's a ton of pressure. Wedding venues are really expensive. They can be really hard to find, amongst other things. Let me back up and review three reasons why your wedding venue is so important and thus can be a little bit stressful to start shopping for. So the first reason why the venue is such a big deal is that your wedding venue is going to dictate the entire style of your wedding. Yes, the venue you choose is going to be an expression of the actual wedding reception itself. So everything from colors to the season to the theme, your venue is going to influence just about every single aspect. The second reason this wedding venue decision is so very important is that your venue is really going to set your guest's expectation from the very moment that the invitation is received. For example, your guest is going to have a very different vision in their head from a barn wedding versus a beach wedding versus a wedding held in your local hotel or banquet room. So I really would like for you to think carefully about the overall vibe that you are looking to convey at your wedding. And I'm going to go into this in much more detail in the actual blog post. But trust me, your wedding venue is definitely going to make a very instant impression on all of your wedding guests. That's not to say that I believe in going over the top or trying to impress people or, you know, putting on fronts for something that you're not. Definitely never spending more money than you have. But just again, to keep in mind that this venue does communicate a lot about you and your partner's styles. And that venue should ultimately match your personality and your style as a couple. And then the third and the very most important reason why your venue is so important is that your wedding venue is going to greatly be influenced by your wedding budget. This is why it is so very important if you are just engaged before you go out shopping for the perfect venue. It is critical that you and your partner get together and have a lengthy discussion about your wedding budget. You don't need to know the exact dollar amount, you know, down to the cents, but you do need to have a very realistic, very general grasp on how much money you're going to be working with before you go out and start shopping for venues. So in this really, really long blog post full of details that I put together for you, I go into great detail on some other things that you simply must have kind of a general idea of before you start shopping. I'm not going to detail all of those things, so do be sure to visit the full post to get a detailed rundown of everything that goes into shopping and laying the groundwork for this. The next thing I cover is some wedding reception venues, just a general brainstorm of some of the different types of venues that you and your partner can consider. So the first category I have down is banquet halls, and this is going to be for a very traditional wedding reception. Most Anyone listening probably has a banquet hall in their local city or town. They're pretty common and available to rent out for special events. I run down a lot of the benefits of a banquet hall wedding, and I'll touch on just a couple of them. The first benefit of using a banquet hall is that it can be a very affordable and budget-friendly option for hosting your wedding. You may find that they make things very easy at a banquet hall, so you can look for venues that are all-inclusive. They may provide a catering package, tables, chairs, linens, provide all of the setup, all of the cleanup. So this is all very, very convenient, especially if you are listening and feeling like you're not going to have a ton of time and a ton of energy to be really, really hands-on about orchestrating all of these different components. So that is definitely a plus to a banquet hall. And there are more, and there are also some disadvantages to using a banquet hall wedding. And again, I'll just touch on a couple of those. The biggest disadvantage that I see in this type of venue is that you're going to lack some of the custom and really, really unique details that you might find in a more unique wedding 
venue. So for example, if you're hosting your wedding in a barn, that's going to be a very unique, very special feel from the second you walk through the front doors versus hosting a wedding at a banquet hall where you might be walking into a big fluorescent lit room that's just kind of a white square box. So I hope that makes sense to you. Again, much more details in that post. I also run through the pros and cons of hosting your wedding at a hotel. I give some examples of rustic wedding venues that I really love, some modern wedding venues if you and your fiance have more of a modern style. I have some ideas for some inexpensive wedding venues that are available again across most any city or town. And lastly, I have a list of unique wedding locations, and these are just completely off the beaten path. You may not have even thought to host your wedding at a local museum or on a sailboat. (laughs) So the sky is the limit here. There are numerous unique wedding locations where you could host your wedding day, and I will do a little spoiler alert. I have a picture in the post about of a wedding held inside an antique store. How beautiful is that? You would not have to buy one single decoration. So again, the sky is really, really the limit when it comes to thinking about where you could host your wedding day. And with that, let's wrap up today's show. There's a ton more valuable information in that blog post that I outlined for you. And I don't want to turn this portion of the episode into me just reading that blog post back to you. So please do head to the website weddingplanningpodcast.co slash WV and definitely feel free to share that post with anyone who's helping you plan. If you have any questions for me about today's show, any other show, or if you want to jump in on future Q&As, come find me on Instagram. Search for Wedding Planning Podcast, all one word. Keep an eye on the stories where I share weekly question prompts. And of course, you're always welcome to send me a DM with anything at all that's on your mind. I have a totally open door and I would love to hear from you. Thank you again so much for being here with me today to talk about venues and let's make a date to hang out again next week. Same time, same place. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. For details on any links and resources mentioned in today's show, be sure to take a peek at the show notes on your mobile device. You can also head over to weddingplanningpodcast.co for a complete library of past episodes and to sign up for weekly show notes and resources delivered straight to you via email. Until next time, have a great day, happy planning, and I can't wait to chat again soon. Cheers! Cheers!